that are developing, leading, and advocating for climate justice and conservation approaches that will protect our lands, waters, and ecosystems for generations to come. So thank you all again for being here. Um, during this webinar, it will be muted. You'll be muted. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your webinar panel. And if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please reach out um, through the Q&A box or you can directly uh, message Kelly Connor or Saul Maldonado. Um, and this webinar will be recorded. It will be available on our website later this week along with the PowerPoint presentation. So thank you so much and enjoy. So I would like to introduce to you today, um, Mike Roberts, our president and CEO. He has worked in different capacities for First Nations since 2002 and came into his current role in 2005. And I'd also like to um, introduce Mary Aldozalda. Aldozalda, is that the, sorry. I tried to work on this in my head. I, I apologize for mispronouncing your last name. I know that's not right. Um, who is a longtime consultant with First Nations and also worked in different capacities and stepped into her role as a director of stewarding native lands in earlier this year, January, 2023. So I'll let them talk more about themselves, but thank you so much, Mike and Mary, for being here with us today and talking about our new fund. So I'll hand it on to Mary, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Marisa. So the Stewarding Native Lands Program is the newest program at First Nations. It was established based on the needs and priorities expressed to us by the tribes and native communities we serve. The Stewarding Native Lands Program has four initiatives that drives our work. We have environmental sovereignty and justice that's focused on protecting communities, land, natural resources from harmful practices, projects, and policies. We have the Ecological Stewardship Initiative. It's focused on management and restoration of resources for our communities and future generations. We have the Climate Solutions Initiative that is focused on social, economic, and environmental changes that can address the ongoing and anticipated impacts of climate change. And we have a Community Pathways Initiative that's all about upholding stewardship traditions and knowledge. So as part of the Stewarding Native Lands Program, we are excited to announce our Tribal Lands Conservation Fund. The TLC fund is designed to ensure support gets to organizations that are both native led and advancing stewardship efforts in a way that is centered on native knowledge and cultural traditions. It is an honor to be here with Mike Roberts to have a discussion on the TLC fund today. So hi, Mike. <laughs> Hello, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Um, can you share some background on the TLC fund, why it's needed now? You've been with First Nations for a while, um, but what was the inspiration now for this? Yeah, you know, um, part of my job is, as CEO is to try and come up with crazy ideas that just make my staff mad, and this might be one of my newer ones. Um, First of all, um, thank you all for showing up. Um, in case you didn't figure it out, I'm Mike Roberts, President and CEO of First Nations and a Tlingit Tribal member. And I'd like to say, Gunashe thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, Mary, to answer your question directly, um, First Nations does a lot of work trying to advocate on the part of not for profits in Indian country um to private foundations and get them to invest more in native-led institutions um we have done everything we can over the last 40 years to try and engage private philanthropy uh we've begged we've pleaded we've cajoled we've flattered we've even tried shaming private philanthropy to, to give more to indian-led programs and here we are 40 years later with a, a woeful 23 one hundredths of 1% of private philanthropy going to native-led institutions. Um, and when you look at 
you know, breaking down that number of um, what Indians are give, are given by private philanthropy, um, only about six or seven million of that go, goes to economic, I'm sorry, environmental protection or ecological stewardship projects that are native led. Um, so at First Nations, we thought there's gotta be a better way, right? Like we can keep pounding our head against the door of private philanthropy with the hopes of them letting us in and with the hopes of um, them funding more in the much needed area of ecological stewardship, or we could try another approach. Um, and so we're trying another approach. Um, the Tribal Lands Conservation Fund is really designed as a vehicle that will let um, smaller donors, small family foundations, individual donors, um, step up and, and help us support the work that we think needs to be done in and among native communities who are doing this frontline work for climate change and, and ecological stewardship. Um, and we recognize that when you look across the, the conservation movement, when you look at the big green conservation organizations, whether it's World Wildlife Fund or the Audubon Society or Nature Conservancy, most of these folks um, got their start and really um, built their, their brand and their base of their work um, through the generosity of individual donors. And um, we thought, well, there's got to be a place for this, a similar support for Native communities for the work that they're doing. And the work that Native communities are doing is vast. That was a very long answer to a very short question, I, I understand. Well, how does the TLC fund change the work being done and supported by First Nations? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure it changes it that much. Um, when, we look at, when we're looking toward the, the TLC fund, um, we, we see like four or five areas of primary um, work that we want to support through this effort. Um, one is just supporting frontline activism, um, Native folks in Native communities who are fighting against extractive industries, either on their lands or in their backyards. And this is something we've been doing for the last, I don't know, five, 10 years through our grant making program. Um, we also think there's a, a place for looking at the, the way in which um, environmental protection tools are used things like land trusts, things like conservation easements. Oftentimes these kinds of tools were used, or in, in many instances, some of these instruments were used to take land from natives, not necessarily help natives preserve land and, 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 and play in the environmental protection game. But we think there's a, an, an opportunity for First Nations and working with partners like the Native American Rights Fund to create similar kinds of tools that are tribal sovereign friendly. And we, are, and we are currently doing that work and hope to continue doing and supporting that work through the Tribal Lands Conservation Fund. Um, I, you know, I think one of the slides we've talked about today um, in this presentation and other times when we've talked about this at First Nations, it's pretty clear that indigenous peoples have had an incredible role in, preserve, in conservation and preservation. You know, the, there's a stat out there that we keep seeing that 80% of the biodiversity left in this world is in the hands of the of indigenous peoples. And we think that's no different than in the United States. Um, so we know that um, native folks, indigenous folks um, with their traditional ecological knowledge and practices are doing their part, um, largely unnoticed, largely uncompensated, but we really wanna make sure that we're able to um, help these folks continue doing what they're doing because they're doing some damn good work, right? Um, and finally, we, we know that um, at First Nations, we, we have kind of an MO here. We do a lot of research and writing and advocacy, trying to make a case for an inclusion of a native voice in many of these conversations. And I think the conservation conversation is no different. So part of what we're hoping to do is at through the TLC fund is continue to do what we do best, and that is, you know, agitating people into um, letting us be part of the conversation. And if they're not going to invite us, that we need to 
invite ourselves to these conversations about environmental protection and ecological stewardship. Yeah, thank you. What excites you most about this opportunity? Yeah, well, there's there's many things, but um, you know, First Nations has always had this this north star of native communities, like that almost everything we do um, has to have um, a real impact on the native communities we serve. And we serve, for the most part, reservation-based native communities and ultra-rural native communities. Um, and many times folks in those communities um, are highly invisible and out of the limelight. Um, and so, you know, I don't think that we're trying to do anything crazily different. We're just trying to find a different way in which to finance this work. Again, you know, I noted that a very small percentage of private philanthropy goes to this kind of work in Native communities, $6, six million a year. Um, we know that, you know, the, the big green organizations take in hundreds of millions of dollars a year to do work. Um, and we think that the work that, or we believe and we know that the work that Native communities are doing is as if is, is as effective, if not more effective than their non-Native counterparts. And we actually believe that, um, you know, they can demonstrate not only will the benefit come directly to Native communities, but the practices and, and work that Native communities are doing is going to be, um, have impact beyond the reservation borders. And so, you know, what do we hope to, what do we hope to um, happen? We hope to have more of this kind of work funded because we know it's being funded at a small scale now and that the potential impact of the work that Native folks are doing in Native communities is, um, I, I don't know if we can even fathom how much uh, impact Native communities can have if, if properly resourced. Thanks. Um, you mentioned private philanthropy. What trends are you seeing today that's impacting the tribes and native communities? Yeah, I, mean, I think that we have seen um, since the death of George Floyd kind of an uptick in funding for BIPOC led institutions. Um, there was a stat during the pandemic that um, I think it was 2020, private philanthropy gave more in that year. Um, to BIPOC-led institutions that it had given in the previous seven. Um, and, and 2020 was a good year for, for BIPOC folks. I wouldn't call it stellar um, with relation to non-Native or non-BIPOC-controlled institutions. Um, so I think it was a good starting point. And people ask me, what do you think of this trend of private philanthropy giving to BIPOC-led institutions? And in my mind, we're talking about a data point and not a trend. I don't know if we've had enough information to understand if whether private philanthropy is actually giving and will continue to give more to BIPOC-led institutions than they have historically. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think that there's optimism there. I think that there's been a blip of more funding, but um, we also, I tell people all the time, you know, we really haven't seen a recession. We haven't seen a major market correction. And oftentimes when you look at private philanthropic funding to BIPOC land institutions, um, it shows up in folks' discretionary grant making pools. And, um, you know, I don't think that's going to change a whole lot going forward. And we're staring down a recession right now. We've seen market corrections in this last year. Um, I think we're going to see that the largest that, that Native communities have enjoyed over the last couple of years, in, in many instances, go away as philanthropy, when they're down to the last three or four billion dollars, start pleading poverty and contracting their grant making to, to Indian folks and other BIPOC-led institutions. Why do you think it's so hard for philanthropy to make changes to how they fund? You know, I... Uh, I'm not sure. I you know, have not been inside the beast. Um, I think in the case of, of Indian folks, you know, First Nations has done some work on looking at the way in which people inside of philanthropy look at Native causes. And when we have a, some research out there called We Need to Change the Way We Think, 
where we interviewed program officers and foundation presidents and board members. And, um, you know, we, we found that um, the, what we experience with foundations is much like what we learned when we, we did this larger study, Reclaiming Native Truth, and that um, Indians in contemporary society are largely invisible to the general public. The same myths and misperceptions that the general public has about Indians is carried by folks in philanthropy. And um, that's a little disappointing given that private philanthropy claims to be more socially aware and more educated, and yet they hold almost a one for one correlation with the general public on how they view Indians. Um, we also looked at the way in which, you know, philanthropy largely hires through headhunters to staff philanthropic functions and, and um, found some, uh, I don't know if it's even called implicit bias, maybe it's explicit prejudice in the, in the headhunting firms that are um, interviewing natives for these kinds of positions. And so you don't, you're not seeing Indians placed in private philanthropy very often, probably three dozen natives in program officer or, or higher levels in private philanthropy. And this is, I don't know what the number is, like 39,000 or some high number of, of private philanthropies in this country. And yet we can only have a, a, a handful of native things. That, it's not true. It's like 139,000 private philanthropies. Um, and they, you know, they, they're um, employing almost 10,000 people and yet Indians get about 36 of those slots, right? Um, so, uh, you know, there's just a, a, an ignorance with regard to contemporary Indian society in private philanthropy. In fact, when we did this work, we need to change the way we think. We engaged with a group out of Washington, D.C. called Frontline Solutions. And um, one of the consultants that worked with us in these interviews with private philanthropy came back to us at, and said, you know, when it comes to funding Indian causes by private philanthropy, um, private philanthropy chooses to be ignorant and ambivalent when it comes to Native causes. So it's almost like they are taking an active role in, in um, not knowing, as opposed to an active role in knowing. And, and that's a bit disappointing. What type of projects would be funded by the TLC fund? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think I, I kind of answered that question a little bit earlier on the kind of the four areas that we think are are highly important. You know, this kind of the frontline activism and the uh, traditional ecological knowledge work that's being done um, in Native communities. Um, I guess, you know, I, I you know, you as the, the head of SNL, right, of our Sturdy Native Lands Program, I kind of turn that question back to you. Like you're you're the one who's making doing frontline work for First Nations and Sturdy Native Lands, and you're seeing the grantees up close and personal on a, on a daily basis. Maybe you can share with our our webinar folks like the kinds of projects we currently fund and how we would like to continue to find resources for these folks. If you could do that in like a minute or two. Yeah, sure. I'm I'm really excited about this opportunity because um, it provides more flexible funding for us to directly serve the priorities of tribes and native communities. Um, I think also too in this area of stewardship, um, stewardship is so holistic in what's being done. There's um, you know, it involves arts, it involves language. Um, and so having it compartmentalized oftentimes when you see um, funding requirements, just focus on the actual conservation work, but not thinking about how it should be more inclusive, especially inclusive of community like elders and youth and funding that type of involvement. I think this is a real opportunity to really get that type of funding in. I also see, and this is what I love most about um, First Nations and the way we fund is we think long, longer term and also more comprehensive. So we're not just uh, serving as an intermediary giving grant, grant funds um, to tribes and native communities, but we also provide the technical assistance. We also provide access to training and workshops and most importantly, peer networking um, and all, through all of this, it's really helping to ensure these projects are sustainable and supported over a longer term. Yeah, no, I mean, thank you for that, Mary. I mean, I think it's really important to, when we talk about the work that First Nations does, and, um, you know, oftentimes when we were engaging with private philanthropy, um, private philanthropy has erected these different silos where they can support different work of First Nations. And, 
And honestly, the, the Student Native Lands Fund or program at First Nations really grew out of some of our, our, our core beliefs around um, you know, having Native folks manage and, um, the assets that they own. Because we know that tribes own you know, huge swaths of land, rights to water, regulatory authority through tribal sovereignty. Um, and, and, you know, in the last, you know, 40 years since the Indian Self-Determination Act of 1975, we see tribes doing amazing things um, and playing catch up at an alarming rate. Um, but when we engage with private philanthropy, we also, we also see private philanthropy coming in and wanting to, like, find a, a small piece of the work that, that a tribe or community is doing and, and fund that exclusively to the detriment of the other parts of that work, right? And in the case of stewarding native lands, we actually, the other part of that, from our, the income of our core practice and belief at First Nations came from our food sovereignty initiative at First Nations. So we saw a lot of um, overlap and integration with the work that we're doing with traditional foods and traditional land stewardship through our agriculture and food systems programs. And, and I think, you know, as we, as we raise money through the Tribal Lands Conservation Fund, that we're able to fund work that is not single sector environmental protection, ecological stewardship. We can fund projects that have many dimensions, whether that's you know, ecological protection and, and traditional ecological knowledge and agriculture and youth development. And I mean, we can just start layering on the different components that a project can have. And, the, and this funding, as you alluded to, can, can really help us fund the, the whole of that project. Um, and so, you know, we believe that when we're able to fund the whole of those projects, we're going to have a whole lot more success than when we bit and piece these projects apart and are only able to, to fund a small sliver of the larger project. Thanks, Mike. How do you see the TLC fund operating in five years and then even thinking further out 20 years? Yeah, you know, I, I saw that question that you guys had, had put on the list for me to answer. And, um, you know, it, it, it's difficult to say, um, but I, so I'll, I'll answer that in two ways. Um, one is we've never done a big campaign like this where we've created a, a, a specific fund for a, a, um, a, a program or a, a focus of our work. So we've never tried to create a, a single funding stream um, around this before. So this is kind of a, a, our first out of the gate attempt. Um, you know, one of the things that we pride ourselves on at First Nations is um, imperfect action beats perfect inaction every time. This is one of those imperfect action moments for First Nations. Um, but, and, you know, so I, I say that all with, to make, you know, create this big caveat that, like we might fall on our face in this fund. Like we might, you know, do this big launch and have this wonderful webinar and print a couple of t-shirts and like no one shows up, right? Um, but in our minds, um, it's worth the chance because um, Indian communities who are doing this work really deserve to have a more robust funding mechanism to fund the work that they're doing. And if it's not First Nations who's going to create this, then who? So we're willing to, you know, put our reputation and our money at risk in trying to, to do more of this. So um, there's my big caveat on, you know, this, this may not be around six months from now, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. I fully believe it will be. Um, I don't think we would have gone forward if we didn't think that this was a viable mechanism for funding Indian country programs. Um, I think when people become aware of the incredible work that's being done on Indian lands, when we can invite ourselves to the, the larger conversation on climate change and ecological stewardship and be there in the room with the big green organizations and, and show evidence-based um, projects of success, not only evidence-based in the time of the TLC fund, but evidence-based in the last couple thousand years of Indian practice that that you know the the outcome will be incredible that people will understand the value in a different worldview one that's not necessarily human centered or capitalistic censored but much more cultural centered um, 
and environmental centered that people will want to continue to support the success of the work that's happening on the ground. So I, you know, I see five years, 10 years out, this being a robust funding stream for Native American conservation efforts. Thank you. I, right now we're gonna transition into the um, Q&A session. So questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat, the Q&A box. Um, and one of our first questions from the audience, Mike, is will there be a separate fundraising for TLC or will some portion of First Nations revenues be allocated to it? Yeah, so um, so I'll tell you how we've done it to date and how we hope to see it going in the future. Um, we were lucky enough at First Nations to receive some money from Mackenzie Scott um that had no strings attached um and we thought this is the this is like the most incredible opportunity for first nations because oftentimes when we get money from funders we're, we're following a funder's agenda or trying to at least you know use our our role as an intermediary to make that transition or that translation between the funders desires and the desires of the communities we work with um, one of the really lovely gifts of Mackenzie Scott, dollars were lovely. Even more lovely was not putting restrictions on how we use these gifts and, let it, and letting us make these kinds of investments like the TLC fund that nobody else was willing to step up and, and fund kind of the startup cost too. So to date, the, um, you know, First Nations has been able to use funds that we've had from previous revenue streams to invest in the startup of TLC. Um, additionally, um, I think it was a year and a half ago or so, we went out to our individual donors and said, we want to fund, we want to, you know, ask you to uh, you know, make an appeal saying, we would love to fund the work we're doing in stewarding native lands. It was kind of a trial balloon for the Tribal Lands Conservation Fund. And it was really well received. Our individual donors stepped up and said, you know, we see the validity in the, um, the native and indigenous ecological stewardship model, let, let us play along. Um, and so going forward, I think that, you know, as we, as we reach out to a broader audience for support, we see this being self-sustaining, that the money we're able to raise from the Tribal Lands Conservation Fund will be able to fund the, the operating costs of the fund, which are right now are pretty minuscule because we run a pretty lean ship here at First Nations and, and have the lion's share of that revenue return to the communities that we're raising money for. Um, you know, First Nations, you know, has an admin rate of less, admin overhead rate of less than 20%. And so we see that going forward um, with the TLC fund. So we see this being self-sustaining um, probably, you know, within a year or two for break even and then long-term, you know, being able to put a whole bunch of resources back in the hands of, of Native people exclusively through this fund. And I, I'm, I think I answered your question. If I didn't, you can, you can ask it again. <laughs> can you help to clarify how making a donation to the TLC fund is different than making a donation to the Stewarding Native Lands Program? Um, honestly, there, there, is, there is really no distinction. Um, you know, this TLC fund is a campaign, is a vehicle to raise money for the work that we're doing for the Sturdy Native Lands Program. Um, it's not a separate program. Again, it's it's more of a vehicle to to direct that those funds to a very specific program within First Nations. And can you share what the campaign goal is and timeline? Yeah, so we <laughs> we've made some. Uh, We've we've made some artificial goals. Um, we are, you know, again, you know, taking into account some of the money we've gotten from McKinsey Scott and some other donors. Um, we've had some donors who are willing to pledge their dollars to help us raise match dollars for this initial um, appeal. And so um, our donors today have identified three fourths of a million dollars to pledge as matching gifts against this fund, and our hope out of the gate for Tribal Lands Conservation Fund is to raise an additional $750,000. So to raise 1.5 million 
in this initial go round and hopefully build from there. Thank you. I think I got that right. If I didn't get that right, Marisa and Jana and Kelly are going to jump in and tell me how wrong I was. So, that, and that's fine because it's not the first time today or this year I've been wrong. <laughs> so how will the funding get out to tribal communities? How will they be invited? Um, is this going to be like a grant? Is it going to be technical support? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think we, again, I think we we saw this as primary, primarily a re-grant. Um, I think we see this, like we see most of the work we do at First Nations, that there's kind of three primary components. One is, first and foremost, re-granting. So really getting the dollars into the hands of people who are doing the work, um, because we know that they're underfunded today. Two, we, we are in a very engaged grant maker at First Nations. And as you pointed out earlier, when we started this webinar, you know, First Nations, First Nations MO is to give money to our grantees and then you know, buttress that with some technical assistance and training support. Um, you know, we recognize that, you know, the, the, the not-for-profit community and native communities is pretty young, pretty small. And you know, most of the groups we work with have budgets of less than $100,000, have one or two staff, you know, really need that technical assistance and training component. Um, we see it as a way of helping uh, our grantees kind of identify the risks of their projects and hopefully with, with the capital we give them and the training we're able to provide, we can help mitigate some of those, those crucial risks that they're inherent in their projects. So, you know, those two components are probably, you know, A and B in the, in the TLC fund. Um, you know, I've mentioned this, this whole, you know, research and advocacy piece. We think that there is some work that needs to be done, some base research um on um the way in which natives practice um there's places for policy papers and and uh, i always get kind of uncomfortable when i say white papers here at first nations i think we should have red papers here but that has a different connotation too but anyway we some sort of brown paper on some of the work that we're doing here at, at first nations and, and really making a case for for indigenous voices to be invited to the longer the larger conversation so you know, I think some of the, the proceeds from TLC will, will fund some of that work as well. There's another question about ways to specifically target and pledge money and support to indigenous nations and organizations in a local area where that individual lives. Yeah, so, you know, one of the great things about First Nations um, that we, we've really made it a priority um, to try and get resources to, to um, not-for-profits in Indian country. And, you know, through our, our grant-making history over the last 20 plus years, you know, we've given, a, we've regranted more than $50 million. Um, but it, in, in many instances, First Nations recognizes that we don't have enough funds to fund the projects that show up on our doorstep. You know, I think one in four of the projects that come in front of us, maybe even less, get funded by us. Um, and if we do our job right in our grant making and our technical assistance, we can get our grantees strategically ready to show up on somebody else's doorstep. So that's one way we think is really important for us to kind of make our grantees more um, marketable to the general public or to foundations. Honestly, like, as much as we like playing this intermediary role, because we, we know that it's an effective way to get money from private philanthropies to the communities we work with, and there's probably a few other ways for us to do so, we would love for our donors, both individual, <coughs> excuse me, and private philanthropy, to find ways to leap over First Nations and find our, 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 our grantee partners directly. And so, you know, if, if folks um, want to find partners in their area, you know, our our website has a pretty good database of the projects that we've funded that people can look in their own backyard and say, oh, I'd like to fund this project directly. And I think we can make those introductions and make those things happen at First Nations. We've done that a lot historically. Thanks, Mike. And for people that are interested in learning more, do you have recommendations um, on any kind of uh, books or anything about philanthropy? Oh my gosh. Um, 
I mean, there's lots of books about philanthropy. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure there's necessarily good ones. Um, uh, let me think about that one. I mean, I, I think we can, you know, we can like, answer that in the chat or we can include some links in the chat of resources that we think are good. I mean, again, I think that the work that First Nations has done on Reclaiming Need of Truth and all the philanthropic publications that we've done in our learning center are, are really good resources for philanthropy. Um, you know, I know that Native Americans and philanthropy has done a pretty good job over the last 30 plus years of, of research and writing on film of private philanthropic practices as well. Um, and I would you know invite folks to, to visit their page and, and, and pill for their resources as well because they this is this is their primary mission. Um, I think there's other groups out there who are doing a, an incredible job. Um, the Native Ways Federation um, organization that was um, started by six Native National Native not for profits um, who provided guidelines to individual donors on the way in which they can evaluate Native nonprofits to, to ensure that the monies that they're giving to these nonprofits is going to worthwhile causes. Because there's a lot, as you might imagine, of unscrupulous folks out there raising money in the name of Indians where not very many of the dollars that get raised go back to Indians and there's not a lot of transparency about the dollars that are given. And Native Ways has been really um, at the forefront of trying to get folks who are raising money in the name of Indians to be more transparent about, you know, how they're, if they're Native controlled, their financial transparency about where dollars come from and where they go. And I think that's, a, you know, the that's how you should um, that's how you should be in every relationship that you should, that that level of transparency and clarity um, between donor and grantee should be at the forefront of that that relationship. Thanks. So in the chat box, someone commented that Pew just turned the reins over to First Nations for the Canada Boreal campaign. Are you seeing any similar possibilities in the U.S.? Yeah. Um, I mean, Mary, you can you can talk about this um, a little bit. You know, there is a lot of there seems to be well, I'm not going to say a lot. There is some movement on the part of government agencies to look at co-management and co-stewardship opportunities with tribes in this country. Um, as, as you've pointed out many times when we've talked internally at First Nations, it's not exactly clear what these things mean. What does co-management, what does co-stewardship mean? And is it a is it a is it a road to land back? And you know, have we fully examined what these pitfalls might be entering into these relationships? Because they're and I say relationships because the map of what these agreements look like is, is pretty broad um, in definition. I would like to believe that there are going to be opportunities in the near future for repatriation, rematriation of tribal lands, or at least tribal control over lands, whether those federal lands or private lands. And I think that, um, you know, hopefully we could emulate some of the things that are going on north of the border in that work. And maybe, you know, again, I would, I would welcome you kind of, you know, chiming in on, on this as well. Yeah, like in regards to the co-management opportunities, I feel like that's particularly huge. I think, um, it, and the need for funding is is real because it's not just setting up these agreements um, with tribes, but also really investing in capacity um, and supporting like workforce development. Because um, especially to to align those stewardship practices that are taking place on federal lands to really be able to support that work. Um, so I just strongly feel that tribes, like their stewardship practices have really shaped the landscape, the biodiversity on the landscape. They are responsible for that. Um, and they have a strong ties and the cultural knowledge to really continue maintaining this. And when we're facing these larger challenges like climate, with climate, we really need to be prepared and really scale up stewardship um, in a way that's going to be able to respond to those changes. 
And what not be any better way than supporting the indigenous communities that have been doing that um, work. Um, so yeah, I think the opportunities are real, um, are big and it's now, now is the time to get to fund this work. Thank you, Mary. Um, there is one question. Um, speaking of land back, do you see this fund as one avenue to help to do that? I mean, you know, we we haven't we haven't fully fleshed out what the the full agenda of this fund is going to be. Um, but we we do see that there are places where there are opportunities for some of these what I call traditional environmental protection tools like land trusts and whatnot. There may be an avenue where we could we could you know work through TLC to help fund or establish a national land trust. That would be the holding company for when people want to give back land to tribes, because oftentimes we see um, there not being a mechanism that can accept land quickly, while tribes either make the decision to take it back or not. Right, so that there's an opportunity for somebody to play that intermediary role again, a role that First Nations is comfortable playing, and be able to provide a longer runway for those kinds of transactions to happen, because most of the time those transactions have a, a pretty short fuse on when the donor or when the recipient is willing to engage in the conversation. Um, so I, I, I see a place for, for First Nations and the TLC fund in that space, honestly. Um, not exactly sure how that looks, but I think that, you know, we have a real, uh, a bunch of really smart people working in communities in Indian country that given the resource, they're gonna be able to figure this out. Thanks, Mike. Um, there is another question about how Native American tribes help with forest protection regarding forest fires. Yeah, um, you know, Mary, I mean, I know you're up close and personal to some of this, so some of the work that we're both doing through SNL and some of the work that you've done before coming to First Nations. I'd love for you to comment on, on that work. Yeah, absolutely. And this is part of some of the, the traditional knowledge that the tribes and traditional cultural practitioners have maintained is their cultural burn, um, actually going out on the landscape and maintaining uh, plants and the biodiversity um, found in these landscapes. And I think that's why we're one of the biggest issues of why we're seeing wildfires today is because native people have been removed from the land and they no longer have access to do this stewardship at a larger scale. I think this is partly, and I referenced it before, but why so much more investment, investment needs to go into stewardship. Um, and this is why the Stewarding Native Lands Program is very intentional about, steward, about stewardship in its title. Um, there's a lot of um, new initiatives like 30 by 30. And you know, there's um, a concern about how that will play out because you know what we've learned is that protecting areas and setting aside areas for protection is not been a really effective model. Um, instead, you really need to be thinking about stewardship and investing in stewardship of these lands in really in order to protect the biodiversity and cultivate that biodiversity. Um, so you know what we're seeing here, and this is one of the why we intentionally have a community pathways program in the stewarding native lands program is we're really investing in that traditional knowledge um, and intergenerational knowledge transfer from uh, elders and traditional cultural practitioners to the youth to make sure that knowledge is protected and it continues uh, on through future generations. Yeah, Mary, thank you. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make, you know, you mentioned 30 by 30 and, and um, you know, one of our thoughts about the, Tribal Lands Conservation Fund was some of this research and advocacy piece that we could do. Um, in many respects, we're very excited that the Biden administration came up with 30 by 30. I'll tell you my wariness and the wariness is driving First Nations. When you look historically at the way in which this country, every time it needed something, broke into the piggy bank of Indian land, 
it's frequent and 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 it's almost always non-compensated whether that's um, land for expansion and homestead whether that's you know resource extraction timber gold whatever even when we look at national parks and national monuments in this country the federal government has taken from indian people to you know set up those kinds of um conservation environments in this country um and so when we look at something like 30 by 30 and we look about across you know where is there untouched or land in conservation well of course when we talk about this you know 80 percent of the biodiversity is in indigenous hands we're going to find that in indian country there has to be a temptation on the federal government's part to be looking at Indian country for an answer, at least in part, for this 30 by 30 question. And if if history is our teacher, federal government is not very good about compensating natives when they take these things. And so I, I, I'm a little bit dubious about what 30 by 30 could mean for tribes. I think there's an, there's an opportunity there, but we should be cautious as well. And I think that some of the advocacy and, and policy work that we could we could be doing here at First Nations and in other places in Indian country is to look at the full impact and opportunities and dangers of policies like 30 by 30. Thanks, Mike. Um, here's another question. Um, does First Nations have a particular approach with um, working both with traditional indigenous knowledge and also modern scientific knowledge? Yeah. Particularly um, in climate change? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the short answer is, I don't, I don't know if we have, well, let me say this. If we have a, a, a particular view on the world, our view is that traditional ecological knowledge should be on par with Western science, and they should be complementary. Um, you know, I have two daughters who both went through STEM programs in, in middle school and junior high and high school, and so the the idea of the scientific method is not is not lost on me. That there you create a hypothesis, you gather data, and you prove or disprove your 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 hypothesis of what you're doing. When you look at traditional ecological knowledge, you have thousands of years of observation and data points that, that tribes and native people have collected on the places where they are, and, and actually on the places where they were, right? Um, and if you're talking about a scientific method, this, in my mind, is as valid, if not more valid, than Western science from an observation, data collection um, point of view. Um, so we, we, we like the best of both, right? We think that there is a place for traditional ecological knowledge and Western science to share the stage in, in this climate crisis we're in. Unfortunately, that's not the way the world is working right now, that, that Western science is, is hogging the limelight and traditional ecological knowledge is not being recognized for the true value it is in, in this conversation. Which I kind of stepped around that question a little bit, but I hopefully answered it most of the way. Thanks, Mike. Um, does First Nations have any templates for stewardship agreements that can be accessed um, for projects? Yeah, Mary, you could better answer that question. You know, if people ask me the details of any of one of our programs, you're going to get the cocktail party veneer of what I know. Um, and people like Mary know a lot more than I do. Yeah, we do have a really exciting program, the Conservation Toolbox. Um, and so we are looking at different frameworks for Western conservation that could um, um, be re-envisioned and aligned with tribal values. And um, in regards to stewardship agreements, one focus area is, is co-management and co-stewardship agreements. And so we are working in partnership with the Native American Rights Fund. Um, and we're, we're looking to compile some agreements, but um, also what's a really important aspect of our work is we help develop uh, publications that highlights best practices and models 
um, for tribes and um, native communities to access um, through our knowledge hub. So we are looking to develop um, some, um, some publications around that, but also there is expected to be a, a larger database that's gonna be housing um, some of those agreements and that's gonna be in partnership with the Native American Rights Fund. Let me see, next question. There's a question about whether the TLC fund will support um, indigenous graduate students that might be doing some of this conservation research work. Yeah, you know, First Nations has a very small um, scholarship program through our um, food systems initiative is an agriculture um, scholarship program for folks who are looking at doing traditional ag or regenerative ag in their communities. Um, we haven't decided whether that should be a focus of the TLC fund. And, and I'll tell you, like one of the reasons I, I'm, I'm balking at that is I think there are some really strong native institutions who do scholarships really, really well in the Native American Rights Fund and um, the, the National Indian Graduate Center, which I know has a different name now, and I can never remember their new name. But these these institutions are very good at, you know, accepting money and, and giving um, Indian scholarships. I don't know if we need to compete with them when there's already vehicles in place that can do that um, and might be more appropriate than First Nation. Thanks, Mike. Um, let me see if there is other questions. I see most people are post posting in the, can you tell us about programs that help facilitate regenerative at rangeland resource management? Yeah, um, that's going to be down to the level. It's going to be better answered by Mary and our team. But let me let me tell you what some of the things that we have seen. And one of the reasons we've created the, this work with in a partnership with Native American Rights Fund on trying to reimagine conservation tools so that they're more tribal appropriate and more tribal sovereign friendly. Um, we had a conversation with a national funder. Well, it was more than seven or eight years ago, who were, was talking about how they were going to invest $25 million in the hopes of setting aside a million acres of land for conservation. And we asked them what that looked like. And it was really, you know, non native buying easements from farmers and ranchers and landholders in the United States. Um, the, the agenda was not very broad when it came to Indian country. We know that there are tribal practices that look awful similar. When you get to the upper Midwest um, in the grasslands area, um, the, the idea behind conservation is to keep that land from being turned under, whether that's oil and gas exploration, whether that's real crop farming. There are tribes in that region who are practicing stewardship that doesn't look like locking everything up and not letting you do any economic development, but they're doing really cool stuff like they're creating buffalo rangelands, right? Uh, they're putting away hundreds of thousands, if not millions of acres of land for buffalo pasture and grazing and, and habitat. The end, the end result that the grasslands remain intact looks exactly like this funder who wanted to spend $25 billion to do. When you ask them if they're willing to fund Buffalo restoration projects that kept the grasslands intact, um, the answer was, oh, it doesn't fit the bill, right? Um, and so I think what we're, we're finding is a lack of imagination around conservation from private foundations. Because if they're really looking at the bottom line result, they would be very interested in the work that tribes are doing that looks a lot like the conservation they want to have happen. Um, and so I think that there's a real opportunity for First Nations and Australian Native Lands Program and the work that we're doing with the Tribal Lands Conservation Fund is to reimagine the, 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 the who gets funded and for what, because we know the results from the tribes are practicing is better and proven and is happening 
every day, not on speculation. That if you give us $25 million, we'll go out and hunt for a million acres. Tribes are doing it without compensation. Let's compensate the tribes for the conservation they're doing. Thanks, Mike. I really appreciate all the insights you provided today. Um, that wraps up our Q&A session and I'm gonna hand it um, over to Jonna to close us out. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Jonna Charette. I'm Northern Cheyenne Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa. Um, I am the Associate Director of Individual Giving at First Nations. I wanna thank you for joining us today to learn more about the Tribal Lands Conservation Fund. Um, things you can do to help spread the word are share information about the TLC fund on your social media, tell all your friends, family, and colleagues about the good work First Nations is doing, and donate directly to the TLC fund. Right now, all gifts would be matched dollar for dollar up to $750,000. You can also follow us on social media. As you can see, they're all posted there. Um, and a fun little thing that we're doing right now is if you give $50 or more, you get this beautiful sticker by um, Native artist Hadassah Green Sky. Um, we are, I also want to share, um, we'll be hosting a second webinar on Tuesday, July 25th at 2 o'clock Mountain Standard Time. Um, this webinar will be highlighting three community partners. Um, who are doing the work in tribal lands conservation. The registration link is not quite ready yet, but it will be very soon and we'll get that um, sent out as soon as possible. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you.